If you work for a sizable organization, chances are your company has a marketing strategy, a corporate strategy, a global strategy, an innovation strategy, an intellectual property strategy, a digital strategy, a social strategy, and a talent strategy. And in each of these domains, talented people work on long lists of urgent initiatives. Our guest today shows how the best companies achieve more by doing less. At a time when rapid technological change and global competition conspire to upend traditional ways of doing business, these companies pursue radically simplified strategies. At a time when many managers struggle not to drown in vast seas of projects and initiatives, these businesses follow simple rules that help them select the few ideas that truly make a difference. We welcome author of Better Simple Strategy, a value-based guide to exceptional performance, Felix Oberholzer G. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Aidan. I'm delighted to be here. I had the great pleasure of sitting in one of your modules in Harvard many, many years ago. And I said to you off air, it was a paradigm shifting moment for me. It really changed how I view the world and sent me on this odyssey that I'm still on. So for that, I'm deeply grateful. And also, you did an amazing job of bringing some of the ideas that you had in their embryonic form back then, it was almost 10 years ago, to life in this book. So it was a real pleasure for me and a great, it's a great uh, moment for me to have you back on the show. So welcome, Felix. It's so good to be here. And, you know, your point about teaching and writing, I think is such an important one. I don't think I would have been able to write this book if I hadn't practiced in a way, you know, tens, hundreds, thousands of times uh, in the classroom, having conversations about strategy, uh, understanding what is easy for people, what is what is difficult, where to, where are the pain points in the strategic decision making process. And so I have come to think of the book really as sort of a combination of everything I learned from everyone else. It's it's I'm mostly putting it all together, hopefully in a form that is that is easy and interesting uh, to read. And you absolutely did that. And I have a copy behind me here, as people can see is watching us on YouTube. You can win a copy of that book just by signing up to the innovation show.io newsletter, and you'll be in with a chance to win the book. I highly recommend this book. It is a must have in your innovation library. So let's dive in, Felix. Again, great to have you with us. You pose some simple questions at the start of the book. For example, how can it be that so many companies, their ranks filled with talented and highly engaged employees, have so little to show for so much effort? We have the most educated workforce in human history and incredibly talented corporate leaders, but why does enduring success so often seem elusive? This is where you start this book and start us on this journey. This is literally the path that I took. I started looking at data of financial performance. And, you know, if you look at a successful set of companies, your first intuition is, oh, these are all household names. These are large companies. They've been around for a long time. Must be that they're all doing reasonably well. And one of my impressions, the reason why I thought that is if I visit, comp I visit many companies every year, uh, to write cases, to do research, to help with strategic decision making. And I'm always impressed by just how much is going on in just about every organization. I mean, it's how you started us out, right? There's almost like these layers of strategy, like every new challenge that arises. Just think about what is happening now. Now we're rethinking supply chain strategy. We're thinking resilience. We're thinking hybrid office. And so we have all of this, these activities. And so you would think, at least if you look at, say, the S&P 500, uh, you're looking at all these companies that are financially successful. And then a little bit much to my surprise, you see just dramatic differences. So if you take return on invested capital uh, as our benchmark for financial performance, you see everything from these superstar companies that have 30, 35, 40% return on invested capital over long periods of time. And then you see S&P 500 companies that have zero. And you're asking, like, how can that be? Like, it's not as though they're just sitting there not doing anything. How can it be that we get such big differences? And then a little more important, a little more interesting, like, what do you do with that observation? Can you, can you figure out rules? Can you figure out 
how the very best companies achieve success, while many others are trying really hard. It's not for lack of talent. It's not for lack of initiative. But somehow it doesn't amount to the kind of success that at least I would have expected. So you build on that then and you tell us about this great concept. And again, I was introduced to this in its early stage. The va- the basic intuition underlying value based strategy could not be simpler. Companies that achieve enduring financial success create substantial value for their customers, their employees, or their suppliers. The idea is best captured in what you propose, which is a simple graph, which you call a value stick. By the way, I still have that value stick in my notes from that decade ago. I still use it all the time. So let's introduce this to our audience. Yeah, so uh, as you point out, the, the, this, the idea is really straightforward. And it surprised me a little bit because when I looked at the super uh, successful companies, I expected them to do something really unusual, something really exceptional, something perhaps also very challenging. You know how we sometimes have this notion in order to be a strategic thinker, in order to set strategic direction for your organization, you have to have a lot of experience, you know, gray hair, wrinkles, all the rest (laughs) of it. And then I was a little surprised that, well, actually, if you look at what these companies do, it's pretty straightforward. They create value for their customers and they create value for their employees and their suppliers. And now you want to be a little careful about what that actually means to create value. Um, value Value-based strategy is a completely data-driven exercise. So it's not about my sense, your sense, some anecdote. It's really like, what can we learn from the data that the company has today? And so value for customers, we start thinking about customer willingness to pay. So this is the most a customer would ever pay for a product or a service. And the value for the customer is the difference between that willingness to pay and the price that you actually have to pay in order to purchase the product or the service. So I'll give you one example. I don't know about you, but I have a hard time waking up in the morning. I really need that first cup of coffee. My willingness to pay, seven, eight dollars easy. <laughs> I, go, I go to Starbucks, they sell me coffee at a couple of dollars. Big difference between willingness to pay and price a lot of value created for customers. And so that's the sense in which you want to select projects and initiatives for everything that comes along, every good idea, every uh, everyone that sees something that might be interesting, say a new technology or a new global trend, you'll always ask this one question, does it increase willingness to pay for my customers? And if the answer is, Probably not. Or if the answer is we're not quite sure, stay away. Don't do it. That is maybe the the main realization that you get from looking at initiative level analyses of firm performance, where you see that, yes, so many people do many things, but among those projects, among those initiatives, many of them don't actually increase willingness to pay. And if they don't increase willingness to pay, they don't really have a chance to further the financial performance of the company. So think of it almost as a lens or a filter. So all the great ideas that come along, you'll you'll measure, oh, how expensive is it to increase willingness to pay if we do it in this particular fashion? And if the data don't look promising, you don't do it. So as a result, the most successful companies, they end up doing fewer things. Much of the success comes from a few key opportunities to create value for customers. Yeah, and I, I absolutely love the simplicity of it. I often think of it as like a North Star or a compass to measure, am I actually building willings to pay here? Think of all the technology that comes along. If you're trying to follow technology, that's like such a, oh my God, every day there's something new, there's something exciting, there's something that could possibly disrupt your organization, possibly disrupt your business. If you try to do all of these things, measure up in every which way that technology suggests might be important tomorrow. It's a hopeless, it's a hopeless task. If you have a real filter, if you say, oh, if blockchain doesn't increase willingness to pay for my customer, blockchain is just not something that I'm going to worry about. That I feel is actually liberating. It focuses the organization on the few things that actually make a difference. Let's bring it to life with a friend of yours, a colleague of yours, and a fellow author with the Harvard Business Press, 
Hubert Jolie. He's a future guest on the show, by the way, with his fantastic new book. But let's bring the value stick to life with the example. He is also former CEO of Best Buy. He was there during a massive turnaround in the organization, and he exemplified the value stick. Yeah, so this is maybe certainly the, one of the most significant turnarounds in the U.S. economy in the last uh, in the last decade or so. If you go back about ten years, everybody was convinced, including myself, that Best Buy would go out of business because many of its rivals, Circuit City and so on, had had gone out of business, and it just seemed just about impossible to compete with Amazon. If you're an electronics retailer. Like how do you how do you replicate the amazing job that Amazon has done? And so we looked at Best Buy. We thought brick and mortar. We thought old school. And we thought, oh my God, this is just you know a question of time until they go out of business. And so he takes on this job, and they go from losing about a billion dollars a quarter. Imagine that, like you're losing a billion dollars a quarter to today return on invested capital of probably 25% or so. It's just like an amazing success. And what's really important here is there are just a few ideas that really made all the difference. One of the ideas that really matter was provide faster shipping. They reconceptualized how to think about their stores. Instead of building these big distribution centers, they started thinking of each of the store as a mini warehouse of sorts. And they started shipping from all the stores to all the customers because they have about a thousand stores or so. Stores are really close to customers. For the first time, they started beating Amazon at shipping times. And it turns out, I don't really know why this is, electronics uh, customers are super impatient. So if you ship faster, that is just a big advantage. And then it turns out many people actually, because the stores are so close, they pick up from the store. And while they're in the store, they buy additional merchandise. They might buy a warranty, which of course is great for the business also. It was this really interesting, super simple plan to increase willingness to pay by providing faster shipping times. And then we haven't spoken about the bottom of the value stick, the willingness to sell. Willingness to sell is probably not quite as intuitive as willingness to pay, but here's a good way to think about it. Uh, Imagine a friend of yours who works at some other company uh, and you would like her to join your organization. You're writing the offer letter and you're thinking about what's the minimum compensation that it will take to make her move from where she is right now to your company. That minimum compensation is her willingness to sell. It reflects how much money it will take to attract her. Uh, and of course, if the dream job, if, if the job is her dream job, then it will take less. So willingness to sell falls if the, if the job is more attractive. If the job is, say, I don't know, physically dangerous, then of course it takes more money. And so willingness to sell goes up. So willingness to sell is a way to measure the attractiveness of jobs. And again, it's conceptually appealing because it's really data-driven. And the same plays with suppliers, with vendors in the best Best Buy case. So imagine a negotiation between a vendor and Best Buy. There is a price at which the vendor will say, well, Best Buy is paying me so little. It just makes no sense working, selling through through this particular channel. That's the vendor's willingness to sell. What did Hubert Jolie and his team do? They essentially lowered that benchmark. Why? Because they made it much cheaper to do business with uh, Best Buy. Really a simple idea. We're all familiar with this. The store in a store concept, instead of spending millions and millions of dollars the way Apple does, uh, building these really beautiful stores. They went to Sony, they went to Microsoft, they went to Samsung and said, well, you know, why don't you spend much less money and you actually have a store at a place that has lots of customers. So willingness to sell the cost of working with Best Buy goes down, creating value. And that value is then being shared between the vendor, they have lower cost, and Best Buy they get lower prices for the merchandise that they buy. And so it's really only two ideas, which I find quite fascinating how you go with two ideas from basically being hopeless to being one of the superstars now. 
willingness to pay as a result of faster shipping times, and then willingness to sell as a result of reducing your supplier's cost, the store in the store idea. Throughout the book, that is a common theme, and you hammer this one home. You take the principal idea that long-term financial success reflects superior value creation. And we, you, throughout the book, you explore how firms in different industries and business contexts have applied this approach in practice. And you tell us, think value, not profit, and profit will follow. That's a very difficult thing for many organizations, particularly the more legacy or complex organizations of the past, to start to think about value because they want an immediate short-term return on investment. It's a difficult paradigm to break through, but you've identified this as a common thread for those successful organizations. That's exactly right. It's so tempting to think, so what do I want from my strategy? Of course, ultimately, we want from our strategy to make us more financially successful. But the starting point is actually not the profit itself. The starting point is the increase in willingness to pay or the decrease in willingness to sell. And here's an intuition why this works. So there are obviously ways to increase profitability by not really creating value for your customers. So for instance, in financial services, uh, it's not uncommon that your broker will sell you something that is maybe not quite right for you. Uh, does that increase the financial profitability of the broker? Absolutely. Does it lead to long run repeatable business that then makes the broker successful in the long run? Not so much. Think of an airline, of an airplane, like all the seats taken now, post, post COVID, most of the seats taken, everybody on that plane will have paid a different price, right? Because the airlines are very good at doing price discrimination across customers. If you look at a flight with an Apple product, you, you see higher prices than if you, than if you look, at a, look at an airline with a, with a PC. Why? Well, because we understand most likely you're a different type of customer, you have higher willingness to pay. But how much value is created by sophisticated price discrimination? Not at all, right? It just flows from the customer's pocket to the company's pocket. Now, why is that not a strategy to be super, super successful? Why does it take value creation? Well, whenever you capture value at the expense of someone, there's going to be pushback. Right? We, we're doing all kinds of things to figure out how do the airlines actually price discriminate and could I find that same flight somewhere cheaper? Or say, if you're trying to squeeze your suppliers, you lower how much you pay without changing their willingness to sell. So you're just taking it out of their pocket into your pocket. What's going to happen? Naturally, the supplier is going to push back right? every which way you can. And so whenever you capture value, without creating value in the first place, there's this natural pushback. And as a result of that pushback, if you want to be in the league of really, really profitable companies, there's no way around value creation. If you create value for your customers, say you have just a better product, you can charge premium prices and both the company and the customer is better off. Or if you lower the willingness to sell of your suppliers, if you lower the willingness to sell of your employees, uh, there's more value on the table, which you can then share. So there's no pushback. And so the reason why value creation is really first and profit will follow, and as you point out, that's really a question of mindset. In the end, for every transaction, I want to say, is this just about swaying a customer to buy, or am I really making this person better off? And if the answer is you're really making that person or that firm better off, then you're in the value creation business and you'll be more successful financially. We're going to come to some great examples you give, particularly Apple example that you give so excellently in the book. I wanted to come back, Felix, to one thing you mentioned there, because you mentioned a metric when you were talking about Best Buy, about the 25% return on invested capital. That will evade many people. They may not have heard of that term, but it's one metric that you figure is a really important metric that if we use it simplifies strategy as well. Let's share this perhaps. Happy to do so. So there's no there's no one financial metric that tells you everything about the financial health of your organization. But I personally really like return on invested capital because it essentially asks if you take the capital from your investors. 
So, you know, perhaps it's a family, perhaps you're a publicly traded company, you're taking that capital and then you generate operating income out of that capital. What's that return? And that's really a great benchmark because it inoculates you against some of the really simple mistakes that company that companies often make, thinking bigger is better, for instance. Well, if bigger takes more resources, and so I'm asking, like, how much do you make out of resources? Maybe bigger is not, maybe bigger is not better. Maybe growth is not right for you. So return on invested capital essentially asks, I want to see the capital that you're working with. Like, how much do you get out of it? And the natural benchmark is, of course, the cost of capital. How much, what are the expectations of the investors of their return? And say, take large US companies, the cost of capital is probably anywhere between 7 and 10, 11% or so. So that becomes your natural benchmark. You have to have a return on invested capital that exceeds the cost of capital. Only then are you truly in a value creation mode. One thing that dawned on me reading the book is I, worked in, in the media industry, for example, and it was a it was a melting iceberg of an industry that was just getting smaller and smaller, smaller, more fragmented, etc. So it was difficult to have wins. But one thing that I found in any industry like that is that most executives will blame the external environment, but not change how they do business themselves. And you tell us it's all too easy to conclude that external conditions limit your potential. In every country you've studied, the data suggest that companies that can companies can earn exceptional returns even in the most challenging business environments and you go on to say while some industries are blessed with high average returns others are less so for example the u.s insurance industry where returns are close to zero i'd love if you took us through this because this is a great example of how you can like the airline prices manipulate value for your customer so this goes back uh, to some I think traditional strategic advice that you should be very careful about the business segment that you compete in. Uh, everybody will have heard uh, where to play, how to win, that kind of formula to success. And it suggests that where you play is actually super, super important. And it comes from the observation, of course, that different industries have different tendency to be profitable. So some industries, you mentioned that insurance in the United States tend to be tough industries. Uh, other industries have greater, greater profit potential. And so the idea is if you pick a really great segment or if you pick a really great industry, you're basically set. And I find that that's inconsistent with the data. Uh, I find that actually the most variation is within industry. Pick like something like insurance, where the average insurance company, its return on invested capital is probably somewhat below the cost of capital. So they're destroying value on average. But I find companies that have 20, 25, 30% return on invested capital. And that is true for every industry, every business I ever looked at. One of the things that I really wanted to convey in the book is this sense of optimism. If, you're, if you sit here today and you listen to the show and you're thinking, well, what about my business? What's our potential to be much better, to perform much better than we do today? I want you to be wildly optimistic. And it's not just because I'm, I, tend, I confess I tend to be an optimistic person, but it's not just me. It's like looking at the data and see in your industry, how much runway do you really have? And the answer for almost everyone, almost everywhere is, oh my God, you have amazing runway. I, I give you a little thought experiment. Let's say, this is for the US economy. Let's say we rank companies from one, the very best, to 100, the very worst in terms of return on invested capital. Uh, and right now at this moment in time, you're 50, you're exactly average. Uh, and say I improve, your return on invested capital by just 10 ranks. I'm not making you a superstar firm. I'm just going, well, you were exactly average. Now you're ranked 40th. What's going to happen to your return? Your return will increase by 20%. Isn't that amazing? 
And you haven't made that much. Pro- I mean, you're not among the elite. You know, you look at Apple and you think, oh, my God. Yeah. Who can be like Apple? Yeah, I understand. Not That's like super, super tough. But just moving away, separating from, from yourself from average already has a dramatic impact on your profitability. And so when people ask, where's my best business opportunity? What I always tend to emphasize is your best opportunity. Best business opportunity is close to home. Don't look, don't look far afield. That's super hard to pull off in the first place. Lots of reasons why that doesn't work out on average. But also just looking at the runway that you have. I think just close by is where the best opportunities sit. You mentioned there Apple, Felix, and Apple is a great example that you mentioned in many aspects throughout the book. And we'll come to, for example, compliments, frenemies, network effects, which you talk about so well. But I I wanted to come back to this mantra that I took from the book, think value, not profit. Because you tell us there's few better places to observe, observe this than at the entrance of an Apple store. Because Apple have created and enjoy both ends of the value stick benefiting from high willingness to pay and low willingness to sell. They are a great example of this. It's really interesting to think about, right? The moment you realize that value created for the customer is the difference between willingness to pay and price. Now that opens up all kinds of opportunities for smart strategic decision making. You can go the Apple route and you can have enormous willingness to pay. People are just in love. They, they, you know, it's not just like an everyday product that you buy. Like you see, <laughs> you see when you see when you see people leave custom the, the Apple store, like this big smile on their face. They already feel like they're a different person because they have now this new Apple gadget. And, you know, by all accounts, they just purchased an overpriced product. But it doesn't matter. Like the premium prices don't matter because willingness to pay is so much higher still. Now, the difference between willingness to pay and price being decisive means there's no big advantage to being in the premium position. So say, take Hyundai cars. Uh, No one ever thought that Hyundai was like the best car in the marketplace. What have they done so exceptionally well? They have moderate prices and moderate willingness to pay, but a big difference still, right? So don't think the only problem, like sometimes looking at companies like Apple, you can think, oh, It's really just a premium position that ends up being really, really successful. And it's not true. The position that ends up being successful is the position that creates a big difference between willingness to pay and price. If you can have quite low willingness to pay, if prices are far lower still, you're in business. You can compete effectively. And so the best strategists just always think in differences. And two types of differences matter. The first is... What's my difference between willingness to pay and price? What's my difference between cost and willingness to sell? And then, of course, differences across companies. If you create an increase in willingness to pay that is the same as everybody else, if your value stick ends up looking like the value stick of everyone else, you don't really have an advantage. Sometimes I meet executives and say, well, you know, my industry is tough because customers are so price sensitive. It's like the moment I try to raise prices by a little bit, like just my margins are basically unchangeable because customers flip from one vendor to another. And I'm thinking, it's not really your customers, it's you. If your value stick looks exactly like everybody else's value stick, how on earth is the customer supposed to choose? Of course, we choose based on price. There's nothing, there's nothing else to choose from. And so this ends up being sort of a pretty good gauge of how differentiated you are in the eyes of the customers. If prices loom really large, there's not much to choose from. If price is criterion number, I don't know, 25, oh my God, your value proposition is really differentiated. And you can see it, the more pricing pressure, the less differentiation you have. And it warns you against imitation, right? So what typically happens, like we see a rival company has a really great idea. (laughs) What do we all think? What do we all do? Oh, this is a really great idea. Let's also, let's do the same thing. Let's copy, let's imitate. No, let's not. 
It's like every time you imitate, every time you copy, your value stick becomes more similar. And as your value stick becomes more similar, price will loom larger in consumers' decisions. Let's identify now one of the differences because there's so many, and I love the way you story tell throughout the book. And I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to do that here, and I'll let you let you take the story. I'll give you a little tea up here. So it's the late 2000s. E-readers were the hot con- new consumer product in the t- in the in the decade. Over a decade after they were introduced in 2004, one third of Americans owned one. A billion dollar market had been born. Amazon was keen to enter this fast growing market, but its prospects seemed limited. That will surprise so many people. Why? Because Sony had adopted the leading technology, was first to market and spent twice as much as uh, on marketing as all its rivals. So let's share how that unfolded and what on earth it has to do with subway tickets. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not so much. <laughs> so so yes, you're exactly right. This was Sony's market to lose, right? It was it was the hot consumer electronics product of the of that time. And Sony was in an amazing position because they had adopted the leading reading technology, e-ink at the time, that really made it quite comfortable to read on a screen. Uh, they obviously had a position in the electronics market in the first place. And then their marketing budget was just like, you know, GDP of a small country. So everybody expected Sony to win. And frankly, when when Amazon entered, like it, it seemed a little surprising that that they would try to go up against Sony. And then, of course, as everybody knows now, like Sony basically got stuck at very small market share and Amazon had a, had a huge success with its Kindle product. And the difference is actually not in the product itself, or at least not in the core functionality of the product. The difference is how do you get the books? So for Sony, you had to go to the Sony store. The store didn't have the greatest selection on the planet, but then you would download whatever book you would find. You would download it onto your PC. You would then connect your reader to the PC and you could finally you could finally read the book. Well, the Kindle obviously was one of these early gadgets that had Wi-Fi access. And so purchasing books became an impulse purchase. So easy, so easy to do. And I find cost, companies that really pay attention to customer willingness to pay, that's one of the things they're really good at. Uh, they sort of go through the customer journey step by step, minute by minute, second by second. And they're always thinking about, are there ways to add value to that particular step. And it turns out here, how you get books, how you get content on your devices was a huge advantage. So you had basically no advantage over Sony in any other respect, like the the reading technology was the same, the gadget was the same, but it was this little step in the customer journey that made made all the difference. And the reason why I tell this this subway, (laughs) subway story in the book is that, If you ask people, you know, think of ticket vending machines for the subway. Like, where would you place a ticket vending machine? It seems like the most idiotic question on the planet, right? Because you think, well, obviously the ticket vending machine has to be outside the station because you need to buy your ticket before you can enter. And then you just spend a little bit of time in big American cities and you look at what those interactions are like. And for many passengers, it's just frantic. Why? Because you realize last moment that you need a ticket. Um, Maybe your monthly card is out of rights. Who knows what happened? And you hear the train come. There's a long line. There's so much frustration. So what if you place a machine not only outside, but you place it on the platform? Because the other thing you, of course, see is that people go through the gates. And then they wait forever on the platform. There isn't really much to do other than looking at your cell phone. And so just like really observing customers step by step, like where do you create stress? Where do you create a pleasant experience? Then leads you to doing counterintuitive things uh, that in a way change how you think of your business 
because your business is now animated by this idea of value creation at every step. There's a, there's a personal story that I tell in the book that I think really a, is a good example of what happens in organizations <clears throat> when everybody's thinking value. Uh, I have a friend in Los Angeles and I sent her flowers for her birthday. And then one year I forgot. I don't know exactly what happened, but you know, her birthday came and went and I didn't pay attention to it. And then a couple of days later, I noticed, uh, I was like, oh my God, her birthday. So I called this flower store in LA. I ordered my flowers. It's late in the afternoon. So the salesperson asks, uh, should we send the flowers today or is it good enough tomorrow morning? And I say, well, you know, it's a little embarrassing. Like I forgot my friend's birthday. It'd be really great if you could send the flowers as quickly as possible. And she asks, should we take the blame? Should we say it was our fault that the flowers didn't get delivered? And, you know, I thought it was so interesting. I'm, of course, I didn't want her to lie for me. But what really spoke to me was this is a person who's not in the business of selling flowers. This is a person in the business of thinking value for her customers, no matter what the circumstances. And that I found in the best companies that have really enormous financial success, driven by thinking about value for customers, thinking about value for employees all the time. That really, in a way, makes all the difference. And you can also see it, you'll see, like when Hubert Jolie comes on the show, he has all of these other stories. What else happened at Best Buy? And you're thinking, oh my God, how do you coordinate all of these activities? How do you actually make use of the fact that your employees have a million ideas also? And many of these ideas are just fantastic, but you need to make sure that you can bundle them. You can need to make sure that they drive willingness to pay just along a few pain points that are relevant for the customers. And this is really how you create value if you if you instill this value orientation in everyone then you can actually decentralize decision making then you can let cascade your strategy throughout the organization because it's clear what i'm i'm not coming up with something that is a poor fit for all the other activities that we have at this point in time i'm not coming up with an idea that doesn't really speak to customers because everybody's thinking value all the time i love what you say felix like when you think about the uh the value stick as a as a compass for everybody in the organization to make decisions they'll also know which suggestions to make and what ones to put into the suggestion box and what ones will actually stand a chance of making it to the top of the organization and you know we have this picture Hubert Jolie wrote the book but he didn't come up with all those ideas he listened to his people he created the environment in which people could come forth with those ideas. I think that's really important to recognize. But I wanted to bring that to some other organization that many people won't know, an extremely strategic move that this organization made. made. Because here you talk about near consumers. And again, in the early 2000s, Meg Whitman, at the time CEO of eBay, was thrilled about her company's prospects in the burgeoning Chinese market. Many people don't know that. But Taobao, had other plans here. And I think it, this is a great story where a strategic move not only intercepted that move, but actually became a, a huge growth engine for what became Alibaba success. The idea of near customers is that you will have some customer groups whose willingness to pay falls just shy of the current price. So they're not in the market. When when you when you you know typically with the help of consulting firms you do these addressable market studies how big is the market really uh, these customers don't really show up because they're not consuming they're not in the market and the question is are there ways for you to lift willingness to pay maybe by just a bit so that these near customers customers who almost buy but don't quite so that these near customers would Turn, were turning to customers. And so, um, as, you, as you explained, uh, eBay really dominated e-commerce in China in the early days. Um, they had bought uh, EachNet, the Chinese startup, um, to HBS grads, uh, uh, and they had built a very successful business. eBay acquired them, and they looked poised to be basically dominant because uh, I talk in the book about these network effects. Uh, businesses that become more successful 
the more customers they have. And e-commerce is a great example. The more customers you have, the more vendors you will have, the more customers you get. And that's sort of a virtuous cycle that reinforces itself over time. And as a result, you look at everyone and you think, okay, so who's going to dominate e-commerce in China? It'll be eBay. And then Jack Ma of Alibaba fame entered the market and they focused on these near customers. This was you know, early days of the internet in China. Many people thought, sort of interesting that I can buy things online, but really like, <laughs> can, I trust the, can I trust the vendor? Uh, are you really going to send the products? Uh, are the products really what I expect them to be when I see them online and so on and so on. So there were many people on the cusp of using the internet, uh, but not just quite comfortable. And they, they created Taobao around a whole set of features and functionalities that were essentially destined to drive up willingness to pay just enough so that these near customers would turn into customers. Um, one, importantly, was Alipay, sort of an escrow service. If the vendor doesn't send you anything, you don't have to pay. One was a very sophisticated two-sided rating system. One was simple things like, you enter the website and because you're new to the internet, you don't quite know what to expect. So they're building the website like a physical department store. It's literally what you know if you know department stores in China, you walk in, oh, there's the men's sections, there's the women's section. And it's exactly, it elicits that same feeling. And so they do a million things to make near customers comfortable. And then guess what? It turns out the group of near customers is much bigger than the group of customers that eBay had. And these network effects that can fuel a business, they can also destroy a business, right? Because then once your competitor has more customers, that virtual cycle doesn't work for you, it works for your competitor. And so they built Taobao, the Tmall, eventually that is really, that is really possible, profitable right now. And, and that's one of the really key engines of growth of the, of the Alibaba group. Yeah, and I'm going to come back to network effects because it's core to your work and it's a great understanding. I got it from your course originally and I've brought it with me everywhere since. It helps, it's a set of lenses through which to look at businesses and which ones will win because there's often a big winner, as you say. And then if somebody knocks you off your throne, you're in danger as well to understand that. But uh, one of the many lessons I gleaned from your module in Harvard was understanding and winning with compliments. I loved the brilliant story. I wondered where I got it from. I hadn't actually taken it down in my notes, but I loved the story of the Michelin Guide. I use this all the time. And what I didn't know was the amazing story and the increasing of willingness to pay the story of Harkins as well. I'd love if you'd tell these. So a compliment is a product or a service, so something different from your core product that increases willingness to pay. So razor, razor blade, coffee machines and capsules, printers and cartridges, lots and lots of examples. And it's really easy to underestimate the value of compliments because when compliments exist, we often take them for granted, right? We're not really, we're not really thinking about them all that much. So take cars as, cars as an example. So if I ask you, Aiden, like what's your willingness to pay for a specific car? I don't know. 20,000, 30, maybe expensive taste, I don't know, $50,000 for a car. And then think cars without compliments. That means no gas stations, no repair shops, no, no roads, no driving schools, no signals, no, it's really all of these other things that make cars as valuable as they are today. And so one of the key issues in identifying compliments is just to have the right idea. What else needs to be in place to strengthen the willingness to pay of my customers? And so Harkins is a, is a movie theater chain uh, out in the western part of the United States. And uh, they look at their data and they notice that young people go to the movies and they are a little older. They still go to the movies. They get married. They go to the movies and then a little while later they stop. What's the issue? Babysitting services. So they have these play centers in their movie theaters 
where you can drop off your kids at the price of a ticket for the movie, so much cheaper than babysitting services at home. And so when I ask people, how do you increase willingness to pay for a movie going experience? What I typically get, for some reason, the, the first suggestion is always better seats. I don't know. People are really happy with the seats. <laughs> I, I <laughs> use this, by the way, with my kids. And my son is only 10. He said better seats. Better seats. Said, Everybody always says better yeah. seats. So that's like, if anyone is listening from the movie theater business, that's like a real opportunity. And then, of course, better sound system, better projection, all these kinds of things. So when you think about ways to increase willingness to pay, Mostly you think about the product itself, right? You think about what can I make better in a movie theater? But the, ch the child care services example is really interesting and powerful because it's one step removed, right? I operate a movie theater, but now I'm thinking about food and drink and I'm thinking about parking and I'm thinking about child care services. Why? Those are all complements for the for the serve for the main service that I'm trying that I'm trying to sell. And so again, like I think looking at customer journeys and carefully thinking about what else needs to be in place in order to increase willingness to pay is really powerful. And it wouldn't be surprising if you ended up thinking about worrying about businesses that seem quite distant from what you do today. And the Michelin example is a, is a great example because you're thinking well, if I want to have a really great meal in some city that I'm not familiar with, like why on earth would I ask the producer of automobile tires? That makes no sense. Like why does Michelin have this guide? And of course, the answer is, oh, early automobile history uh, in France, all the car cars are in Paris and people just drive locally. And if you only have local traffic, you're in the business of making tires. That's now the very promising industry. And so you're thinking about helping people make longer journeys in the interest of them using up lots and lots of tire. And so it's quite interesting how they then, in the beginning, it has lots of maps in the guide because people don't really quite know where to go. The restaurant recommendations, of course, make it more likely that you'll go to some place, uh, the hotels that they recommend and so on and so on. And so it's a it's a great compliment in the sense that it encourages behavior that then in the end supports the company's core business. And that's the way to think about compliments. What else needs to be in place that would lift willingness to pay? And maybe the most beautiful thing about this compliment relationship is that if the price of the compliment falls, willingness to pay for the core product goes up. Okay. Why is this so important? Well, if you think back to the Amazon story, the reason why Amazon was interested in producing the Kindle in the first place is that they expected the future to be in ebooks. And in ebooks, differentiation is basically impossible. An ebook is an ebook is an ebook. So they expected really stiff price competition in ebooks. The price for ebooks falls. Whenever a price falls, you ask, what's the complement? for which willingness to pay will go up. And that, of course, is the Kindle. So it was a way to insulate their business against the future possibility that eBooks would be very popular. Now, of course, we know it's about 20% of the market or so it's not that popular, but it was a very smart move in thinking about whenever you expect the price to fall, the first thing you wanna ask is, oh, what's the compliment? Where does willingness to pay go up? That might be a real business opportunity. I didn't say this to you, but w when I did that course with you in Harvard, it was, um, it was a, a real paradigm shifting moment for me just to have that access to education, different ways of thinking, different ways of seeing the world, the business world. And it, it set me on this journey of writing. So I, I have a practice of I write a blog every week, an article every week. And I, I, I just published my book, just in the last year as well. That all came from that, just to say. But I am, I'm so lucky. You, you said to me about the stickability of doing a show. I'm doing this now over six years. And I haven't missed a, write, a week of the show or my writing in, in six years because I get so much from it, you see. And, and one, of the, one of the things, I was writing this article a few weeks ago and I was, it was inspired by something I saw that Tesla were getting into restaurants. 
And so people are like, going, what the hell they're doing? The brand isn't that strong. And I was like, straight away, I thought of the Michelin story because why would Tesla get into restaurants? Because people can charge their cars as they're eating. Because if they increase the openness and the desirability of electric cars, then they have more people will buy electric cars. Now, as you say in the book, sometimes somebody will open their technology or open source their software so that all all boats rise with a rising tide. So because they want the whole industry to win because then they can have a bigger portion of a bigger industry. And I think that's an important aspect as well, because a lot of people will think in closed aspects. But when you start to think more open, particularly with the internet, you can win big as a result. The key challenge is really, are you trying to support the industry as a whole? So in which case you would provide compliments that serve anyone, right? Michelin is a great example. Uh, the Michelin guide was helpful even if you didn't have a car with Michelin tires. So it helped everyone who sold tires. Now, Michelin having being the market leader, having great market share, of course, most of the benefits uh, went to the company. But say in, in electric chargers for cars, the real question is, do you want to make them specific to your cars? Or do you want to make them general for the industry? If you make them specific to your product, that's powerful because it attracts market share against everyone else, right? So if say Tesla has a much better charging network compared to every one of its competitors, that of course will sell more Tesla cars. At the same time, that choice makes the industry not grow quite as fast. So if you're trying in particular early on, if you're trying to get an industry off the ground, it's good to provide compliments that support everyone because we're trying to create as much value as possible. Uh, Michelin, again, a great example. They lobbied the government for street signs. They even <laughs> sent some of their workers out to install street signs so that driving would become, would become easier. Those are all actions early on in, in an industry where compliments can really lift everyone's fortunes. Speaking of charging stations and Tesla, a great example you give in the book, and it's very relevant in today's world is renewable energy. And we've seen that this has experienced a revolution of sorts. But here you talk about compliments, because this is a key aspect. And I thought we'd share this because so many of our listeners are entrepreneurs, startup, uh, startup founders, CEOs and C-suite executives. And if they understand things like this, they'll make decisions differently. Because you talk about the price of photovoltaic cells, and how they fell dramatically, making solar energy far more competitive than ever. And what that usually means people are like, Oh, no, the price has fallen off, we're not going to make as much profit. But if you think in compliments, you think totally differently. Yeah, that's right. So whenever you see that price fall, you're thinking about, oh, what's the complement? Here, obviously, the complement to solar panels is installation services. So it used to be that it was almost impossible to make money off of installation. Uh, price of solar panels falls. Next thing you see is that solar panel installation becomes much more profitable. And so the installers now, for the first time, are making decent money. And so it's really the mindset that you can shift profit pools back and forth. Maybe the most dramatic example that we see these days is the Apple story. Apple, for the longest period of time, used to really not make money in services, uh, used to keep prices in iTunes so low that after credit card processing costs, the service basically broke even. Now, a first intuition would be to say, well, if iTunes doesn't make us any money, why have the thing? Uh, what is it good for if, you know, it's effort and you don't really get to show anything for it? And of course, that will be misunderstanding the complementarity between services and the hardware that Apple has. So we're keeping the prices of iTunes and the App Store low in order to increase willingness to pay for hardware. Now, these days, hardware has become very competitive. The iPhone used to be you know, basically the only game in town. Now, of course, worldwide, if you're looking for a phone with a really great camera, your phone is probably not an iPhone. If you're looking for a phone with really fantastic integration between apps and the operating system, your phone is probably not an iPhone. And so Apple essentially has lost its competitive edge in hardware. What do they do? 
They bring hardware prices down. You remember the cheaper phone that they now offer in places like China. And at the same time, they shift the profit pool towards services. So uh, in the last decade or so, gross margins and services in the App Store have increased fourfold. And then you get that tension. I talk in the book about complementers being frenemies, uh, friends because they help increase willingness to pay, enemies because then they want to share some of the value that you help that you help create. And you remember just in the past couple of months, there's this big lawsuit between Epic Games, like the gaming company and Apple. So Apple shifts the profit pool towards software, now taking 30% of essentially everything. And guess what? There's pushback. The gaming companies, of course, they're happy that Apple exists because they distribute their games via the App Store. But at the same time, the 30% <laughs> cut, that just hurts. And so you always get the squabble between complementers. So if the complement is not something that you produce in-house, uh, if the complement is maybe something you have some control over but not complete, not perfect control, then the complementer will be both a friend and an enemy at one and the same time because it's hard it's hard to predict how much pushback there will be if you try to capture the value that the complement helps create. Which leads us beautifully to network effects because if I think about my Apple experience, I I use Apple Notes, for example. Uh, that's how I take my show notes all the time. I use Apple Notes because it shares it to all my devices from my iPad, et cetera, et cetera. I can easily copy from Apple iBooks. I can copy from the Kindle. All these things are connected. And in a way, I'm locked in then into the network. And I go, oh, if I have to move to an Android phone, that's going to mean a change in everything. My cloud, all my photos are on iCloud, et cetera. So I'm locked in. And then on top of that, I think about network effects, for example, FaceTime or iMessage, for example, being able to just connect to somebody without a network, etc. All those things lock me in, which raises the issue of or the opportunity of network effects, but also the understanding of them. Because what I got so much from understanding all these different elements of complements and understanding network effects was actually how these businesses operate. And it made me realize how few businesses understand this. And if they did, what a competitive edge they would have. I'd love you to take us through network effects. I'm happy, happy to. So the basic notion is that the more users you have, the more customers you have, the greater my willingness to pay. So net, think of network effects as something that operates on the willingness to pay side of the value stick first. I'll give you a, a willingness to sell example in a moment, but let's think about willingness to pay first. So say uh, WhatsApp. If I'm the only person on WhatsApp, uh, not super useful. Uh, the moment more people join, WhatsApp becomes more and more useful. Uh, and so many businesses, in particular internet businesses, are exactly that way. Facebook, the more users you have, the more fun it is, the more content you have. Uh, Uber, oh, if I have more customers, I get more drivers. If I have more drivers, I get more customers, and so on and so on. So, so the thought experiment that you want to have is always think of a customer who owns your product or, your, or uses your service today. Are there ways to make that customer better off if more people join? If more people buy your product, does that customer's willingness to pay increase? If the answer is yes, so if you, think, if you can think of a mechanism to make that happen, you have identified a network effect. And network effects tend to make it quite difficult for other companies, for rival companies to come into the market. Because now we have size or the number or the value of these connections the the, the users as a deterrent, as a barrier to entry, if you will. And so we used to be super, super optimistic that essentially every market would turn into a winner take all if there were network effects. Now we're a little more cautious in many of these network effects in many of these network effect markets actually some degree of competition will exist. But it's nevertheless true that not every startup, not every one who hasn't played in your market, will be able to compete with you. And so the question is always like, can I think of ways how I make someone better off if more people join the product or the service? 
Let me give you a story on the willingness to sell side. Uh, we haven't really spoken that much about willingness to sell. So that's a that's a good that's a good opportunity also. So remember, willingness to sell for employees has to do with how attractive are these jobs. And if I make a job more attractive, that will lower willingness to sell, making people better off. Uh, the Gap ran a really interesting experiment that I think tells us a lot about ways to make work more attractive. And what I find particularly noteworthy is that if I ask people, how do you make a retail job more interesting, more fulfilling, you know, we would end up with maybe training opportunities, maybe improving processes in the store. And the gap focused on something that not many retailers in the U.S. focus on. And being a retail worker in the United States is actually quite stressful because you never really quite know when you will have to work. So you learn your shifts about a week in advance. Uh, and then sometimes you get more shifts and sometimes you don't get that many. So on top of making it super difficult to plan your life, you now also see that retail workers' incomes fluctuates by as much as 40% from week to week. That just causes incredible stress. What does the gap do? It doesn't think about training. It doesn't think about work processes. It thinks this is the issue that we're going to solve. And they use a very simple app called Shift Messenger. Essentially, it allows people to trade their shifts, right? I was assigned a particular shift. My child has fallen ill. I can't show up at work. As a result, I make it available to everyone else on the network. And now notice, the more people on that network, the more valuable it is because it's more likely that someone else will be out there who really loves that opportunity. Uh, so people who say, well, you know, it's the end of the month, I need extra income uh, to pay my rent. They say, oh, here is like a bunch of shifts that no one wants, and they take it on, they get more work. What's the net effect? Uh, same store sales go up, labor productivity goes up, because people really want to be at work when they're at work. And maybe most important, workers re uh, report that they're much less stressed about their jobs because now I can plan my life. Now I have more predictability what my income is going to be. Maybe the, the best the, the statistics that I was most enthusiastic about was parents with kids who work in retail report sleeping better. I mean, it's really just, I mean, just like the simple thing that you did. But of course, Shift Messenger for The Gap also worked really well because it was a big enough network that if I want to give up a shift, if I'm looking for an extra shift, that actually we had enough liquidity in the market. In, in many markets, we, we call it, what we call liquidity is really a network effect. They had enough liquidity in the market to make those trades possible. Tens of thousands of shifts were traded, were traded uh, during, while, they ran, while they ran this particular experiment. It also goes to show on the willingness to sell side I really need to think very broadly about what it means to create more attractive jobs. But right? it's not just about the work processes. It's about a broad understanding of all the kinds of things, all the joys and all the pains that go into work, that go into having a particular position. Work is my commute. Uh, work is how do I need to get dressed uh, in the morning? Work is what happens if I make a mistake at work? Is someone going to yell at me? Will someone understand? And so on and so on. So there, there are thousands of facets to work, and every one of these facets can be made better. And if we do it in the right way, willingness to sell will fall, value will increase, and I think it's particularly important in service industries. So sometimes people ask, oh, you know, how do you get better services? Uh, given that services are more than two thirds of the economy. And the answer is always, you have to start lowering willingness to sell. Because if you have a disgruntled workforce, a workforce that doesn't really care about the quality of the services, there's no chance on earth that you can increase willingness to pay by having great service. So you need an advantage at the bottom of the value stick in order to create an advantage at the top of the value stick. Fantastic. Wow, that was a very long-winded answer. Beautiful, to a short beautiful question. answer. I, I, you, have, you have five minutes, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, the way I finish most shows, Phoenix is, uh, Felix, is I have a quote and I pull a quote that I absolutely love. Um, and then I ask the author to do the same, maybe just a final message to our listeners. 
But th- this is the one I pulled. And I just want to remind our listeners that I have a copy of this brilliant book up for grabs. Just sign up to the Innovation Show .io newsletter to be in with a chance with that, to win that. Felix, before we even do that, do the quote, where can people find you if they want to reach out to you looking for keynotes, wanted to work, find out about your work, your strategy work, where can they find you? So you can find everything that I write on the Harvard Business School uh, faculty page. Uh, I always make sure that things are available there. Uh, if you're into podcasts, I have a podcast with uh, two colleagues of mine called After Hours. Uh, we're three friends, all faculty at HBS. We talk about current topics, current affairs, business, culture. Uh, that, I think, is a good way. And then I'm active on LinkedIn. So if you're a social media person, uh, you will find me on LinkedIn for sure. I'm going to give this quote and maybe it might spark you as well, because uh, there was a couple of messages in the book. We've talked about most of them, but I love this one. If there's one message I'd like executives and listeners of the show to get across and get out of today's show it's that you say the most sophisticated businesses use three approaches to get closer to the the truth pattern recognition trend analysis and experiments while no one knows the the trajectory of technology understanding how the cost of developing complements can elevate or diminish the importance of network effects It's a critical skill that every strategist needs in their toolbox. I just wanted to pull that because it it brings together a few of these skills that you talk about and articulate so brilliantly in the book. I loved that. And maybe that might spark some thoughts from you. What's your final message to our listenership? In a way, it speaks to this issue of living with great uncertainty, right? Think about the situation today with COVID. How many of the changes will persist? How many of the changes are fleeting? Think about the future of globalization. We used to be so sure that we would live in a more integrated world, in a more global world. Now, not so clear. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, Think of the political divisions. Uh, We used to be so sure that liberal democracy was the future. Now, in lots of places, uh, who knows exactly? And so... Given the great uncertainty, I think what becomes important, all important in a sense, is having a lens to read the shifts in the landscape. What matters to your business? What is not so important? What should you focus on? There is no chance you can follow everything. There is no chance you can get predictions right time after time after time what the future will look like. And so having a lens that will tell you These are the important kinds of developments to look at. These are elements that, you know, they may change the world, but they don't change willingness to pay or willingness to sell in my business. All of that I can set aside. Focus on a few things. Focus on value creation, and you'll be more successful in the long run. Author of Better, Simpler Strategy, A Value-Based Guide to Exceptional Performance, Felix Oberholzer G., Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Aiden. This was, this was uh, great fun.